Hello all, welcome back to Climate Dynamics. In today's lecture, Lecture 4b, we're going to be discussing dry convection. The corresponding reading is Marshall and Plum, Chapter 4. In this section, we're going to define rayleigh bernard convection, unstable atmospheric conditions, stable atmospheric conditions, brunt visala frequency, mountain lee waves, and temperature inversion. The key questions that will be addressed are, what role does convection play in the energy budget? When and why does convection occur? And what are the characteristics of convection? In the context of the parcel model, what is the meaning of stability and instability? And what are the conditions for environmental stability and instability? Finally, what atmospheric features arise under stable and unstable conditions? All right, so we've been looking at this energy diagram through much of the class. So far, we've already looked at incoming solar radiation, which represents all of the yellow exchanges, as well as terrestrial radiation, which includes the red exchanges. However, the one feature that we haven't yet investigated is energy exchange due to convection and condensation. That is shown in the middle of the diagram and corresponds 29 normalized units into a exchange between the surface energy budget and the atmospheric energy budget. So when and why does convection occur? Well, convection occurs because solar input is continuously warming the surface. The surface it has a temperature of approximately 288 Kelvin, and the atmosphere emission level is about 255 Kelvin. However, the radiative exchange is not sufficient in order to balance this underlying energy model. Instead, we need to include convective exchanges as well. So these occur when the surface temperature becomes too warm, triggering rising air. The rising air occurs because the warmer temperatures are associated with lower densities, and lower density fluids will then be buoyant in the environmental background. Specifically, solar radiation warms the surface. We get temperatures that are too large at the surface for the system to be stable, and consequently this triggers convection. Convection then results in an exchange of air between the near surface and the atmosphere. The high potential temperature air at the surface is then exchanged with the low potential temperature air aloft. Because the atmosphere is thin at the upper levels, the energy here can then be radiated out to space. Consequently, at this cooler emission temperature of 255 Kelvin, much of the radiation that is emitted then can escape up through the thin atmosphere above it to space. Since surface temperature is significantly higher than temperature at the emission level, the energy flux at the surface must balance both the solar radiation and the downwelling infrared radiation. This is then accomplished through the addition of convection to the energy balance system. The schematic shows, shown here depicts a simple form of convection known as rayleigh bernard convection. In this case, there is no horizontal flow, but instead we simply have a warm lower surface and a cool upper surface. In this case, this could correspond to the surface layer and the tropopause. When conditions are met for instability, which are not investigated in this class, the system produces overturning cells known as rayleigh bernard cells. These cells are, include a rising portion as well as a sinking portion or subsiding portion. Fluids heated in this manner tend to develop these form of overturning motions, since the decrease in temperature at top corresponds to an increase in density leading to sinking fluid, and the warming at the surface leads to less dense fluid, which leads to rising fluid. Analogously, here is a depiction of what one might see in a pot of boiling water. In such a pot, you have heating incurred from below through the oven. Consequently, the water at the bottom of the pot tends to be warmer than the overlying fluid. When the conditions for instability are met, that is, once the, once the temperature gradient between the bottom of the pot and the top of the fluid is sufficiently large, then overturning will occur. This overturning then takes the form of these Bernard cells. Here's a three-dimensional depiction of rayleigh bernard convection. You'll notice that the rising motions tend to be locally confined with a large subsidence region surrounding them. The width of these convective, convective cells is actually a function of the underlying characteristics of the fluid. However, two questions still emerge. Why do these motions develop when the equilibrium state just discussed has no forces anywhere? That is, there's no incurred forces except for a 
temperature gradient. And why are the motions horizontally inhomogeneous when the external forcing is uniform? Namely, if you impose a uniform underlying heating to the system, why do you get convective cells with a characteristic length scale associated with them? Here's a depiction of a rising warm bubble that would occur in an idealized system. Here we have a altitude of 1,000 meters corresponding to, for instance, an inversion region and a horizontal distance of 1,000 meters. Again, this is a fairly idealized problem, but should give some idea of what rising motion looks like for a idealized warm bubble. In this case, the buoyancy associated with the warm bubble allows it to rise. The fluid moves upwards within the tank, and as it hits the lid, it then spreads out in the lateral directions. Because, again, this experiment is confined, we see that as it interacts with the sides of the domain, you then have some sinking motion associated with that bubble as well. All right, here's an analogous depiction showing how convective motions actually occur horizontally. In the center, we have rising motion associated with warmer, less dense fluid. As that rises and hits a convective lid, or hits the top of the convective region, we then have lateral spreading associated with the fluid, and then as this air cools, as it radiates away its excess energy, it can then subside and sink back down to the surface. In this way, conservation of mass is maintained by the convective plume. Convection is closely related to the notion of instability. This question, why do motions develop when the equilibrium state has no net forces anywhere, is closely associated with the problem of placing a ball on a hill slope. In this case, we have two configurations, one with a ball located at the top of a hill and one with a ball located at the bottom of the hill. Both states are technically in equilibrium. There are no forces being experienced instantaneously by either ball because the underlying surface has zero derivative. However, any small perturbation will then have very different results. Specifically, in configuration A, a small perturbation can grow. That is, the ball will end up rapidly rolling down the hill. Whereas in configuration B, it's confined to the bottom of the hill. A small perturbation or bump of that ball will allow it to continue to be confined in the lower portion of this valley. One can assess this situation mathematically as well. The acceleration experienced by the ball is proportional to the gravitational acceleration and the hill slope. If we consider small perturbations uh, about an equilibrium state, here being equilibrium states A and B, we can expand these via Taylor series expansion. Since at the equilibrium level we have di h di x at the equilibrium point equal to zero, we would then have that the um, hill slope at a small offset uh, is going to be proportional to instead the second derivative of the hill slope multiplied by its displacement from its current location. Thus, plugging these, this expression into our equation for acceleration gives an acceleration in terms of the second derivative of the hill slope and a small displacement from that equilibrium position. Now we know since the velocity is equal to the time derivative of the offset, and acceleration is equal to the time derivative of the velocity, we can then obtain a differential equation for the quantity delta x here, which again is the displacement. This is simply a second order differential equation in time. The hill slope here, di squared h di x squared at equilibrium, is considered to be a constant. So again, it's basically a constant coefficient second order differential equation in a dependent quantity delta x. By solving this equation, we can then assess how delta x is changing in time. Do you remember what the solutions are to this differential equation? It turns out that there are two types of solutions that arise depending on the sign of the constant coefficient. In configuration A, we have that the system is effectively an upside-down parabola. Consequently, the second derivative of the hill slope at this location must be negative. If we then plug that into the right-hand side, we have negative g times the second derivative of that hill slope is positive. So a positive value of delta x will lead to a positive acceleration. 
Look at this equation on the top left. If delta x is slightly positive, then what you will have is that the second derivative of delta x with respect to time must also be positive. That is, the displacement must be increasing with time. If, on the other hand, you have a regular parabola, with, such as in configuration b, then you have that the second derivative of the height function with respect to x is positive. Plugging that in on the right-hand side results in a negative constant coefficient, and so a small delta x displacement will lead to negative accelerations. That is, as delta x moves farther away from point b, or as delta x represents a distance farther away from b, then we will have a restoring force or a restoring acceleration that will attempt to either slow down the ball or accelerate it back towards the bottom of the valley. These solutions are known as the unstable solution and the stable solution. In the case that you have the uh, configuration A, which is the unstable solution, one can solve explicitly for the uh, solutions for delta x as a function of time. One obtains two solutions since it's a second order differential equation, one being an exponentially growing solution and one being an exponentially decaying solution. The exponentially decaying solution will quickly go to zero in time, whereas the exponentially growing solution will represent an instability. It grows without bound as a function of time. It will quickly dominate over the decaying solution. The stable solution, on the other hand, is a trigonometric function. In this case, we can choose that that function is equal to a sine wave. And the particular solution that we get is delta x equals some constant times the sine of omega t plus phi. Omega here represents a oscillatory uh, frequency of the ball in its current configuration. And in fact, it can be calculated directly as the square root of the coefficient found in front of the delta x term on the right-hand side of this equation. In terms of energetics, what is happening is that in position A, the ball is converting potential energy into kinetic energy as it moves down the hill, and hence, it, as it falls, it accelerates further. Whereas in position B, the ball must convert kinetic energy into potential energy in order to climb the hill. Since it has limited kinetic energy, that is, the energy is only equal to the amount of perturbation provided by pushing the ball initially, it can only use that energy in order to convert it to a limited amount of potential energy, so it's unable to climb fully up the hill. All right, let's see how this uh, idealized description of stability and instability connects with dry atmospheric convection. All right. Let's look at what we just learned in the context of dry atmospheric convection. In particular, the model that we'll be assessing involves a fluid parcel embedded in a background environment. Analogous to the behavior of temperature within the troposphere, we have warmer conditions closer to the surface and cooler conditions at higher altitude. The parcel itself, as it moves, will adjust instantaneously to the uh, environmental pressure. The temperature in the background is assumed to decrease linearly with altitude, that is, we're assuming a constant lapse rate. In the parcel model, we're going to assume an initial perturbation to displace the parcel, so we're going to move it up and down slightly. We're going to assume, again, that the pressure adjusts instantaneously to the background state, but that the temperature within the parcel follows the dry adiabatic lapse rate. That is, we're going to assume that there is no condensation, evaporation, or external heating applied to the fluid parcel. That is, although the background environmental profile is prescribed, that is, it does not necessarily follow the dry adiabatic lapse rate, we will assume that motion within the fluid parcel does follow this change. Alright, let's consider our first situation. Our parcel is initially displaced upwards. Because the pressure decreases with altitude, we must have also that the temperature of the fluid parcel decreases. If it now finds itself cooler than its environment, what will happen? Well, because the air parcel is cooler than the surrounding environment, that must mean that it is also more dense than the surrounding environment. Thus, buoyancy forces the fluid parcel to then sink. This is an example of stability, that is, an upward perturbation of the fluid parcel is then compensated because of the adjustment. Consequently, this small perturbation does not allow the fluid parcel to move infinitely from its initial, from its initial location.
This is an example of a controlled perturbation. Recall back to our example of the ball located either on top of the hill or in the valley. Which analog is most appropriate for this case? All right, let's consider a second situation. If the parcel moves up and finds itself warmer than the environment, then what will happen? Well, because the fluid parcel is warmer than the surrounding environment, it is also less dense. Thus, buoyancy indicates that the parcel will continue to rise within this environment. This is an example of an instability, that is, a growing perturbation. Compare this again to the instance where we have a ball either on top of a hill or in a valley. This is analogous to the case of the ball on top of the hill, that is, your initial perturbation or displacement from the top of the hill will then grow with time as the ball rolls down the hill. So in summary, the rate of decrease of the temperature with altitude, that is the environmental temperature profile, determines the stability of the surrounding environment. In particular, how that environmental profile compares to the dry adiabatic lapse rate indicates whether we have stable conditions or unstable conditions. In the case of stable conditions, the environmental temperature adjusts fairly weakly with altitude, such that as the air parcel rises under the dry adiabatic lapse rate, it finds itself cooler than the surrounding environment and thus will sink back down. Thus, the perturbation is controlled. In an unstable environment, the background environmental temperature adjusts itself rapidly with altitude. In this case, a rising fluid parcel undergoing dry adiabatic motion will find itself warmer than the surrounding environment, and thus will continue to rise. Comparing again to the situation of the ball on top of the hill or in the valley, the unstable case compares to the instance where the ball is located on top of the hill. That is, a small perturbation grows. Whereas under the stable case, a small perturbation is control. That is, the ball will remain in the valley. So the formal definition of this is that under at unstable atmospheric conditions, small perturbations in the position of air parcels will grow with time whereas under stable atmospheric conditions, small perturbations are controlled. That is, the air parcels will tend to resist movement or perturbation. Surface warming is responsible for building up instability and driving the environmental profile into a more rapidly decaying profile with altitude. Consequently, the presence of surface warming can destabilize the surrounding environment and hence be a trigger for atmospheric convection. We'll now examine these conditions quantitatively. Consider a background temperature profile that decreases linearly with altitude, that is, a constant environmental lapse rate, gamma. In that case, the background temperature profile is equal to a surface temperature minus the lapse rate times the altitude. Recall that the lapse rate is generally a positive quantity, even though it represents a decay of temperature with altitude. So, if we consider this in a perturbative sense, if we have an initial altitude z and a offset altitude z plus delta z, then the change of temperature in the environment can be obtained by plugging it into this linear relationship shown above. And going through a simple manipulation, one finds that the change in temperature experienced by the fluid parcel undergoing a small displacement delta z is equal to negative gamma times delta z. That is, a positive delta z, which moves a parcel to a slightly higher altitude, will result in a negative change of temperature. So, if we consider the change of the temperature within the fluid parcel, on the other hand, the delta change in temperature of the parcel is again described here. However, the lapse rate experienced by the fluid parcel is not the environmental lapse rate, gamma shown on the previous slide, but is instead the dry adiabatic lapse rate, again assuming the parcel is undergoing dry adiabatic motion. However, the temperature profile is nonetheless linear. That is, we can plug in our z plus delta z perturbation from the initial altitude for the fluid parcel and obtain that the change in temperature is related to delta z via linear proportionality where the proportionality constant is the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Recall that the dry adiabatic lapse rate is simply g over cp or approximately 9.8 kelvin per kilometer. So under stable conditions, the temperature of the fluid parcel must be cooler than that of the surrounding environment after it undergoes its initial perturbation. That simply means temperature of parcel is less than temperature of environment. However, 
Since we've shown on the previous slide that the temperature of the parcel undergoing a small perturbation is simply delta temperature, we then must have that the change in temperature of the fluid parcel must be smaller than the change of the surrounding environment. Recall again this is based on our initial assumption that the temperature of the parcel matched the environmental temperature. If we then plug in our expressions for delta T parcel and delta T environment from the previous two slides, we then have negative gamma D delta Z must be less than negative gamma delta Z. Delta Z can be divided out of this expression, and we can multiply both sides by negative 1, which forces us to then flip the sign of the inequality. Consequently, in, under stable conditions, we have that the environmental lapse rate must be smaller than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Again, this corresponds to what we discussed earlier in this lecture. Namely, we must have that the environmental profile decays less severely than the dry adiabatic lapse rate for stable conditions to persist. Under unstable conditions, we have an analogous derivation. That is, the temperature of the parcel must be greater than the temperature of the environment. If the parcel is warmer than the surrounding environment, then it will continue to rise against this background profile. This means that the change in temperature of the fluid parcel after it is perturbed must be greater than that of the change in the environment, or that negative gamma d delta z must be greater than negative gamma delta z. Again, flipping the sign of the inequality after multiplying through by negative 1, we have that the, this means that the environmental lapse rate must be greater than that of the dry adiabatic lapse rate. That is, the temperature decays more rapidly with altitude than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Thus, we obtain a simple stability criteria from physical argument, which allows us to determine whether or not a local lapse rate is, provides either stable or unstable environmental conditions. Under unstable conditions, we have that the environmental lapse rate is greater than the dry adiabatic lapse rates. Under neutral conditions, which is in between unstable and stable, we have that these two are equal. And under stable conditions, we have that the environmental lapse rate must be less than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So the key point to emphasize here is that a compressible atmosphere is unstable if temperature decreases with height faster than the adiabatic lapse rate. Again, keep in mind that adiabatic is not the same as isothermal. And this is because in a compressible context, we have that the temperature of the fluid parcel will change because of the changing pressure of the surrounding environment. So as the fluid parcel moves up and down, undergoing adiabatic or reversible motion, we have that its temperature is changing. All right, let's consider what happens to the displacement of the fluid parcel under each of these conditions. We're going to assume that the environment is in hydrostatic balance, meaning that there's no inherent acceleration within the environment. This means that it must satisfy an uh, a hydrostatic balance relationship, such as negative 1 over rho environment times di p environment di z minus g equals 0. However, our parcel will be experiencing an, ac an acceleration embedded with this within this environment. So we will assume that the change in velocity, that is the vertical velocity of the fluid parcel, a quantity associated with this fluid parcel, will be given by a buoyancy force, where the buoyancy force is determined by negative 1 over rho parcel times di p environment di z minus g. Note that the reason we're using the pressure of the environment in this relationship is because that is the pressure that is exerted on the exterior faces of the fluid parcel. And we further assume that the pressure of the fluid parcel is instantaneously adjusted to that of the surrounding environment. As discussed earlier, this is not an unreasonable assumption because the fluid parcel will expand or contract depending on the pressure felt from the exterior environment. All right, so let's go through some mathematical derivations for the acceleration experienced by the fluid parcel. Using the hydrostatic balance relationship on the previous slide, we can substitute that into our acceleration of the fluid parcel. That then allows us to write the acceleration purely in terms of the density of the environment and the density of the fluid parcel. This makes sense because, as we discussed previously, the density difference between the environment and the parcel is really what determines whether or not the parcel is buoyant within the surrounding environment. That is, if the parcel is more dense than the surrounding environment, we expect it to sink. That is, it will experience a negative acceleration. That is, W will tend to be negative in that case. 
However, if it is warmer than the surrounding environment, it will also be less dense. Thus, it will experience a positive acceleration. That is, W will tend to increase. All right, so by ideal gas law, we can also replace density with temperature. Consequently, if we make that substitution, we then obtain an expression for the second derivative of the vertical position in terms of gravity times a difference in the temperature between the parcel and the surrounding environment. All right, we can now substitute in our linear temperature profiles. Specifically, we know that the parcel is rising at the dry adiabatic lapse rate, and we know the environment is changing at the environmental lapse rate. Substituting these into the equation then allows us to eliminate the thermodynamic quantities and replace them purely with the, the vertical displacement z. Note that this displacement is against a background initial altitude z0. All right, we now end up with a expression here that is nonlinear in z, and that is because in the denominator we have a t of at z0 minus gamma times z minus z0. This makes the equation a little bit harder to analyze, but we can use a Taylor series expansion, or more specifically a binomial expansion, in order to replace this 1 over t at z0 minus gamma times z minus z0 with a term which is linear. The binomial expansion says that this term is approximately equal to 1 over t at z0 times 1 plus gamma times z minus z0 all over t at z0. Note that t at z0 is of course a constant based on the initial altitude of the fluid parcel. So this resulting expression is then linear in z. All right, substituting in that binomial expansion and ignoring terms that are quadratic in z, we can obtain an approximate formula for small perturbations from an initial altitude z0. That then gives us an expression that is a second order differential equation in z, or the displacement altitude. Defining delta z as z minus z0, we then obtain this final expression at the bottom. All right, again, this is a second order differential equation in the displacement delta z. This is an ordinary differential equation. Do you recognize this equation from earlier in this discussion? In fact, gamma d and gamma are assumed constant, g over t at z0 is assumed constant, so this is a second order constant coefficient differential equation. And in fact, this is exactly the same differential equation that we solved earlier for a ball located either on a hilltop or in a valley. The three solutions from this equation correspond to stable, neutral, and unstable atmospheres, and are purely dependent on the sign of the constant coefficient in front of the delta z term. All right. Let's look at the qu quantitative solutions to this equation explicitly. In the case of g times gamma d minus gamma over t at z naught greater than zero, we have a stable atmosphere. That is, the solutions are sines and cosines. One way that we can write this expression is then the displacement altitude is equal to some constant displacement altitude delta z naught times sine of n times t plus a phase displacement phi. Note that the quantity within the sign must be unitless. Consequently, this n has units of inverse seconds. In fact, n here is a special quantity known as the brunt weissala frequency. It's given by the square root of g times gamma d minus gamma all over t at z0, and it represents the oscillatory frequency of a dry air parcel under stable environmental conditions. Recall, these sinusoids are oscillatory functions. So if we give it an initial displacement from its initial location equal to delta z0, it will tend to oscillate about its reference altitude z0. In this case, we have a fluid parcel that rises in its surrounding environment, finds itself cooler than the surrounding environment, and thus sinks. However, when it reaches its initial altitude of z0, it nonetheless still has a downward velocity associated with it. That is, it was accelerating downward in the background the whole time that it was sinking back towards its reference altitude z0. Consequently, it will overshoot that initial position until it finds itself warmer than its surrounding environment. 
In this case, then, we have that the fluid parcel rises and until it again hits Z0 with an upward velocity. Thus, this stable solution describes vertical oscillations of the fluid parcel in the background. It rises, sinks, rises, sinks. An example of a stable environment can be seen in this picture. Here we have a train of clouds with roughly constant spacing between them. In this case, we have some sort of background wind coming from the left-hand side of the picture. In the stable environment, the fluid parcel is displaced upwards. That upwards displacement is then leads to cooling because the fluid parcel is, of course, cooling at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. However, in this case, we also have some moisture within the fluid parcel. That moisture then condenses, leading to the formation of clouds. However, the fluid parcel is still stable within this environment, and so it sinks back down. Thus, there is a gap as that fluid parcel sinks against the surrounding environment. As it rises back up again and finds itself cooler than the surrounding environment, we again get a cloud band. It then sinks again and rises back up again, and we get a third cloud band. This pattern of clouds is not uncommon, and it is indicative of underlying stable conditions within the environment. Here's another example showing a similar phenomenon. I encourage you to go out on nice summer days in order to spot this kind of feature within the clouds. Here's a schematic diagram showing what could give rise to such a cloud train. Here, mountain Lee waves are responsible for inducing the upward and downward motion of the initial fluid parcels. However, because the background is stable, we have then that the fluid parcels will simply oscillate about their initial altitude. So a typical path taken by each of the flu three fluid parcels at three distinct altitudes in this case are shown with the three squiggly blue lines. At an appropriate altitude, we have that that particular fluid parcel, when it rises, will produce a cloud and when it sinks, it will not. Thus, we have roughly equal spacing of these cloud bands as they pass uh, beyond the mountain. This is a typical depiction of the formation of mountain lee waves in a stable environment. Clouds that form directly over the mountain under such an environment produce a very specific type of cloud known as a lenticular cloud or a lens-like cloud. Here is a depiction of what one such lenticular or lens-like cloud may look like over a particularly tall mountain. Again, these clouds tend to form under stable conditions. You have motion of the air parcel going up and over the mountain, and then sinking motion on the other side. If we were under an unstable environment, the fluid parcel would continue to rise against the background state, forming a much deeper cloud. All right. Here's a question to test your knowledge. Under typical tropospheric conditions, we have that the potential temperature is 300K at the surface and 340K at the, in the troposphere at a height of approximately 10 kilometers. If the wind is blowing at 20 meters per second horizontally, can you calculate the approximate distance between cloud decks that have formed in the lee of a mountain range? I encourage you to examine how these potential temperatures would then enable you to calculate the lapse rate of the fluid, consequently allow you to calculate the brunt visala frequency, and then use that expression for the vertical displacement of the fluid parcels to estimate how long it takes for the fluid parcel to undergo a single oscillation. Once you have that quantity, and knowing the background wind speed, you can then calculate the distance between cloud decks. Stable conditions also emerge under the case of uh, temperature inversions. A typical low-level temperature inversion corresponds to the reversal of the normal behavior of temperature within the troposphere. That is, because of, for instance, radiative cooling in the near surface, one will have that you will have a cool profile in that near surface layer. Consequently, we have temperatures that must increase with altitude. Within the inversion layer, then, it must be the case that fluid parcels are unable to rise above the cap of the inversion layer. Consequently, we have stable conditions that are present at the cap of that inversion. This is a case where temperature actually rises as one goes up in the atmosphere, and is a very stable arrangement of the environment. These type of conditions are commonly produced during calm winter nights. 
when there is significant radiative cooling occurring at the surface. Temperature inversions can be seen very readily, for instance, when one is climbing mountains. In this case, you can see a cloud deck which is confined to the lower level of the atmosphere and is unable to rise above that point. The cloud de deck is produced because radiative cooling has forced air parcels in this region to cool beyond the uh, saturation point. Consequently, condensation has occurred. However, these parcels are not rising against the background because warmer air aloft prevents those air parcels from rising farther. Temperature inversions are also responsible for smog layers that often occur among cities located in valleys. A common example in the United States is Los Angeles, where, because of the underlying topography that surrounds the city, often one finds that pollution is confined to the uh, city, whereas at higher altitudes, it, the conditions are much clearer. In this picture, we see smog trapped over the city of Almaty, Kazakhstan, during a temperature inversion. Above the inversion, we have clear conditions and can clearly see quite far. However, under the inversion layer, the smog is trapped. Again, air parcels are unable to rise above the inversion layer, and so the pollution as well is trapped within the city. Temperature inversions can also emerge via what are known as trade inversions. These can be created because of descent within the air. That is, under conditions such as we experience in the subtropics, air tends to subside and descend as it cools. Within a layer, approximately 6 to 8 kilometers designated here, we have temperature that decreases with altitude. But as, that, as those air parcels that bound that particular layer sink, they compress and consequently take up a thinner band of altitude. Following the dry adiabatic lapse rate for these fluid parcels as they sink, one finds that as you compress the layer, that you also get an inversion in terms of the temperature profile. That is, the sinking air changes the temperature profile from being one that cools with altitude to one that warms with altitude. The result is a near-surface inversion here shown between fluid parcels C and D in the end state. Neutral conditions are only touched on very briefly here because they're really a very much a special case. In the case of neutral conditions, the background environmental lapse rate matches that of the dry adiabatic lapse rate. In this case, that whole second term in this differential equation is equal to zero. Solving for this, one finds that the initial displacement uh, is enhanced equal to a constant velocity u0 times a time t. That is, the fluid parcel tends to either rise or sink linearly with respect to time. It does not experience acceleration, but instead the fluid parcel maintains an initial velocity. This condition arises because the only initial condition that we've imposed on this equation is that the displacement at the initial time is zero. Instead, it, if it has an initial upward velocity associated with it, it will then continue to maintain that upward velocity in this environment. All right, let's turn our attention to unstable conditions. In this case, the coefficient in front of the second term is negative. The solutions that then arise from this second order differential equation are exponentials. One term corresponds to a growing exponential, and the second term corresponds to a decaying exponential. Again, these are the same solutions that arise in the case of a ball sitting on top of a hill. At least one of these terms must grow without bound. As time becomes increasingly large, the decaying solution will become increasingly irrelevant and will be dwarfed by the growing solution. In this case, because the constant coefficient is less than zero, it's the second term, the one prefixed with coefficient b, that grows without bound. Recall, growing without bound in this case simply means that the displacement from the initial position grows with time. So what happens in this case? Well, our initial fluid parcel accelerates upwards. As it accelerates, it gets a larger displacement from its original position. This implies an even larger acceleration. Consequently, we end up with exponential growth of the displacement. That is, with respect to time, the total displacement grows exponentially fast. Again, in this unstable case, we end up with instability because the fluid parcel is warmer than its surrounding environment. And this warming becomes more enhanced the 
farther up we are displacing the fluid parcel. Unstable conditions arise uh, in nature, particularly in the tropics. In these cases, we have very warm fluid parcels located in the near surface and rising air that rises rapidly against the background state. In this picture, we see an example of an anvil cloud over Africa that is produced by rising air in an unstable environment. The environmental conditions become stable once we hit the tropopause. That is, we have temperature that is effectively constant with altitude. Recall in our discussion of stable conditions that any constant temperature profile with altitude or temperature that increases with altitude corresponds to stable conditions. Consequently, air parcels that hit the tropopause can rise no further, and so when they hit this point, they instead expand laterally, leading to the flat surface of the anvil. These cumulonimbus clouds are quite common worldwide, not just in the tropics. In fact, we see them in e particularly in the Great Plains and the U.S. Midwest as well. Effectively, they occur whenever an environmental temperature profile decreases sufficiently rapidly with height, which can occur either because of surface warming or because of upper level cooling. Here we see a depiction of from above of thunderheads that loom over the U.S. Midwest in 2003. Again, we see an analogous structure to what we saw in the previous picture. Dramatic, puffy, rising motions in the form of cumulonimbus clouds that when they hit a stable layer end up expanding out laterally. Elsewhere in the image, we see cumulus and other cumulonimbus clouds that correspond to either shallow convection or deep convection episodes. The deeper convection episodes correspond to taller cumulonimbus type clouds. All right, let's revisit this question of static stability. So far, we've talked about an environment being stable in terms of a condition that depended on the lapse rate of the environment. However, an even simpler condition could come into play by using the potential temperature instead of the environmental lapse rate. Recall that the brunt visala frequency defined before refers to the oscillation frequency of fluid parcels in a stable environment. It is left as an exercise to the reader to show that the brunt visala frequency can also be represented in terms of potential temperature through the single term relationship shown here. That is, the square of the brunt visala frequency is equal to g times the derivative of the logarithm of potential temperature with respect to altitude, or g over theta times d theta dz. Using this equivalent definition, one can then show that stable, neutral, and unstable conditions are equivalent to stable conditions corresponding to di theta di z greater than zero, neutral conditions corresponding to di theta di z equal to zero, and unstable conditions corresponding to di theta di z less than zero. That is, if the potential temperature increases with altitude, then the environment is stable. This makes sense because the potential temperature is conserved following the fluid parcel. So if a fluid parcel rises in this background environment, it's going to maintain its potential temperature and hence will be cooler than the environmental potential temperature. On the other hand, if potential temperature decreases with altitude, we then have that potential temperature of the fluid parcel, which is again conserved following that fluid parcel, will be greater than the surrounding environment when it rises up. So these conditions are then perhaps a simpler, more intuitive representation uh, of stable and unstable conditions. So this gives us two ways of determining dry static stability of the atmosphere, either via environmental lapse rate, shown on the left column here, or via potential temperature, shown in the center here. Again, recall this entire discussion has been built around dry convection. In the next lecture, we will talk about moist convection and how that affects our discussion of stability. Okay, so let's consider a simple scenario here. We have a vertical potential temperature profile that looks as follows, where warming of the surface has resulted in a potential temperature that decreases with altitude in the near surface. Halfway up, we see a roughly constant potential temperature profile with altitude, and then above that, we see an increase in potential temperature with altitude. What happens to fluid parcels A, B, and C when they're perturbed under dry conditions? I'll give you a moment to think about this. Okay, so what we find is that fluid parcel A is stable 
that is a small perturbation of fluid parcel A in this environment will result in that fluid parcel oscillating about its initial position. So its altitude does not grow substantially with time. Recalling back to the be beginning of this lecture, that is effectively as if par fluid parcel A is confined to a valley. Fluid parcel B is under neutral conditions. However, it has a stable layer above it. That means that it may rise slightly within the neutral region, but when it hits the stable layer, it will then be unable to rise farther. Fluid parcel C, where potential temperature decreases with altitude, is unstable. That is, as it rises, it will be warmer than the surrounding environment, and consequently will rise farther. Since potential temperature is conserved following the fluid parcel, it will actually follow pretty much a direct vertical line in this diagram. That is, potential temperature of the fluid parcel is conserved, and will, it will rise to the level where its potential temperature matches that of the background environment. So in this diagram, it follows the black line depicted here rising until its potential temperature matches that of the surrounding environment, at which point it is then under stable conditions and will oscillate about that altitude. Here we see a snapshot of a convecting boundary layer. That is, we have a lower layer of the atmosphere where convection is occurring because, for instance, one has potential temperature that decreases with altitude. However, it is capped by an inversion. At the inversion, the temperature can jump up suddenly over a very short vertical distance. And above that, we have potential temperature that increases with altitude. Consequently, in the turbulent boundary layer, we have violent turbulent motion and mixing that is occurring. However, above that, we have a stratified layer where there's very little vertical motion of fluid parcels because of the stability. This particular snapshot was taken from a large eddy simulation conducted on a computer system, but it's a representation of what also occurs in the atmosphere every day. The key point that I want you to take home after this lecture is that convection is designed to be an inherently stabilizing process. Whenever you have warm conditions at the surface and a stable layer above that, the convection, when triggered, has the role of basically mixing up that layer and driving it towards neutral conditions, where we have a roughly constant potential temperature profile with altitude. Similarly, the convective process mixes up any fluid-related quantities within this convective region. So moisture and other atmospheric gases are mixed as a consequence of convective activity. Convection tends to occur in regions that are the most unstable. Although on the large scale, and in a time average sense, the atmosphere shows potential temperature that increases with altitude, localized warming can trigger convection through surface warming. This can then lead to a reversal of the potential temperature gradient with altitude and consequently trigger convection. In regions which are inherently uh, associated with weak potential temperature gradients, such as in the tropics, we see that this is where convection tends to be the most prominent. So looking at this diagram, we can see that the tropics will tend to be the most unstable and, mo and tend towards the production of convection, whereas in the polar regions we have a stronger potential temperature gradient with altitude, and hence it requires much more surface warming in order to trigger any sort of convective activity. We'll investigate this in more detail in the next lecture, where we investigate where on the Earth's surface convection occurs. Alright, that's it for today's lecture. Thank you very much.